Professor Marjorie Ryan teaches world literature, humanities classes, and the first year writing at UW-Whitewater. She's fascinated by how literary texts represent the role of humans in the natural world and how storytelling can play a powerful role in environmental advocacy. She's working on a book entitled On the Lip of the Lake, Essays Meandering Through Lake Mendota's Natural and Cultural History. And she's joined us today to help uh, share what she's learning so far. So I'm gonna stop sharing if I can do this. And then, whoopsie, there we go. And then uh, Marjorie, you can begin sharing when you're ready and take it from here. Thank you. All right, so can everybody see my screen? Almost, oh, there it is, yep. Okay. Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, I'm happy to share my presentation with you today and I'm especially happy um, to have a couple of my sisters joining from out west where I'm from um, to share our virtual space and um, hopefully some also a few people from Friends of the Lakeshore Preserve and Holy Wisdom where I volunteer. And before I begin, I would like to emphasize two points. Um, this presentation was created using ArcGIS, so the whole presentation is readily available via one link. So if anybody ends up wanting a copy of it for some reason or to look at some of the images more closely, um, just you know, let, let me know and we, I can get you that link. And also, I'd be really happy to share this or something similar at other community groups or any group you're involved in, of course, at no charge. So if if something interests you and, and, um, and that seems like something you wanna do, again, just get in touch with me. And my email, you can see on this screen is just my last name, Ryan, with the initial M and then at www.edu. Okay, so um, to start moving down our screen, but it's not part cooperating. Good morning. Okay, so Good morning. I would like to extend four invitations today as we look at these four tundra swans. Um, but we'll invite on your ecological identity, which I'll talk more about in a minute, and to marvel over Wisconsin's landscape, the gift of the glaciers, and then ponder why we love watching birds and hopefully decide to spend more time watching birds and to spend more time writing. So the first thing I want to talk about is ecological identity. And I want to do that by exploring the roots of my ecological identity. And I'd like to share this picture of my family in Yellowstone National Park in 1967. Oops, let me go back a little bit up here. OK, so just a few points about who is in there. Um, I'm the front row with my little red pants and butterfly hooded sweatshirt. And um, looking down, I think lovingly at me on my right hand side is my mom wearing that white sleeveless shirt. And my dad's over on the left with um, far left. And then a couple other people I'll mention today, um, just my sister Susie, who's standing next to my dad. She's 15 in this picture and she's holding my baby brother Orv. And then my sister, Kathy, who's with us on Zoom today too, is unfortunately <laughs> shadowed there in the background, but so she's um, 16. This was a huge event in my family to go all the way from Tacoma, Washington to Yellowstone for a family. We never did this before and we never did anything like it again, um, and, but it was really memorable. So I'm going to just read this little script um, about my ecological identity, you can read along or just close your eyes and listen. But I think that no matter what our childhood was like, and I think a lot of people like me know that our childhoods were not exactly all idyllic, but if we focus on what aspects of our childhood enriched our connections to animals or the natural world, we can find um, all kinds of, of uh, wonderful things. So here's script was a miserable guard um, and mom loved pansies and lilies of the valley and she was just delighted by the sparrows and robins that visited our yard and my sister Susie captured blue-bellied lizards, lizards and when she became a teacher had frogs and lizards in her classroom 
and we had prolific fruit trees in our yard and the Cascade and Olympic mountain ranges on the horizon inspired me to dream of being a vet or of hiking there, sorry. And our dogs had adorable puppies. I constantly read books about animals and dreamed of being a veterinarian. We pretended our stuffed animals were injured and played animal hospital. We grew up about a half mile from a park with a five acre old grist. We walked along paths softened with blankets of pine needles and dared to cross mossy oh, logs <laughs> fallen across ravines. I loved Smokey the bear and Woodsy the owl. And I wondered if I could ride on a giant moth like Dr. Doolittle and put a stopper in the top of the Tacoma smelter that spewed arsenic and other toxins into our air and contaminated our soil. I was awed and overwhelmed by the beauty and danger of the Pacific Ocean. And after studying marine biology in high school and collecting specimens in the San Juan Islands on a field trip, I was planning to major in marine biology in college. Okay, so I want to look at this image of a tree now as a way that some scholars in the field of um, environmental studies have talked about imagining your ecological identity. Uh, what they suggest is that you draw a tree and then on the tree's roots, you write down all of these things from your childhood um, or your youth that you can remember that connected you to the natural world. And so you can see all the things I just read to you, I, I wrote down on this tree. And um, I think this would be a super fun thing to do with grandkids or um, just sit down with any child you love or do for yourself is just like, remember kind of fun things, positive things about your childhood and what you did out in nature. And then the idea for an ecological tree is that on the branches, you write down your values or beliefs that emerge from th those roots. So if you go down um, on the right hand side, the little branch I wrote down, humans have a responsibility to protect natural habitats from pollution, fire, and misuse. So I very much grew up with that feeling. And then forests are alluring places as I go up the branches on the right hand side. Mountains draw us to dream and explore. Then on the left-hand side, I wrote down at the top, humans should be kind to animals. That was a clear message I picked up in my childhood. And tending plants is fun. My dad um, was such a gardener that I also became a big gardener. The ocean is awe-inspiring. And the animal and state are magic. So to this tree, if anybody's interested, a blank copy of this drawing and made it into a PDF. So it's something that I could share, but it also might be even a cool community workshop. If you think about a community creating such a tree on a wall and then different people contributing their branches um, and values. Okay, so, but despite um, going to college and thinking, I'm going to be a marine biology major. I ended up as an English major, which is something that often happens, actually. Lots, there's a lot of crossover between biology and English for some reason. I found English professors much more affirming and welcome. And, um, and so my point here is I turned 60 recently, and I used that year to kind of think back decade by decade over my life. And I realized that in my 20s, it was dominated by graduate school, right? I came to Madison, studied comparative literature. And the picture you see here on the upper left is at the end of my 20s, I lived in Japan for 15 months as I finished some teaching and research. And then the picture to the right of there is in my 30s, my life was dominated by getting my first job in Louisiana, getting married, having a baby, getting tenure, right? I was busy with those kinds of issues. And then I had come to Madison area to UW-White and become director of the honors program. Um, and as director of the honors program, I tried to really engage students in hands-on experiential learning. And this is a picture of a time when we used the opportunity of being at a national conference in Phoenix. And we um, added on a side trip to the Grand Canyon. And this is just some of the students who were traveling with me at the time. So, 
just to continue this ecological identity story, I'd lived in Wisconsin as I neared 50 for nearly as long as I had lived in Tacoma growing up, but I still long Northwest, but how, <laughs> so this is um, my, my daughter Matilda with her um, arm around her boyfriend, Josh at Mount Rainier National Park a couple summers ago, just to kind of share that Mount Rainier played a really huge role in my life, just seeing that mountain on the horizon growing up and, and being around mountains. So how did I start to fall in love with Wisconsin? Well, ironically, it was a trip to Japan in 2010 that began to transform my relationship to Wisconsin. Um, and so two honors students, John Hetzel and Jay Stokes, kept pestering me to join a study trip they had for so I had a project how environmental in Japan was tapping in Buddhist and Shinto values. And this was the beginning of connecting my scholarly interest to what's called place-based studies. And I began to interweave my academic worth with the love of wild places and creatures for the first time. Previous to that, I'd really been a literature scholar studying contemporary world literature and, and not kind of connecting this part of me that was interested in nature. So for that trip, I bought a new camera and um, started taking pictures of a natural place. And one of those students, uh, Jay Stokes, I had become friends with his dad as well, David Stokes, who some people might know as a big nature educator in our area. And David encouraged me to share these photos on different Facebook sites um, uh, that had to do with birds and with Wisconsin uh, naturalists. And I started just getting so much affirmation and um, I don't know, engagement and joy from that experience of learning so much from other people and their IDs of their photos and having people be excited by what I found. And that one day I, I saw that I, um, there were spots in a Wisconsin Master Naturalist course um, at Warner Park. So I decided to sign up. And um, Wisconsin Master Naturalist is a 40 hour session of training and field trips uh, that um, is like becoming a master gardener. You're learning a lot about our community and different ecological projects and getting set to be a, a good member of our community and volunteer in these ways. So in my case, there were two big takeaways from becoming a master naturalist. One was I started learning about the geology of Wisconsin, which I'll talk about next. And I started volunteering at Prairie and Oaks and at Restoration at Holy Wisdom Monastery and the Lakeshore Preserve. And by working on these projects, I began to think much more deeply about how important these ecological communities are. For example, how native plants help control runoff from agricultural fields and thus lessen the amount of excess nutrients like phosphorus that get into our waterways and cause toxal algal blooms. So it turns out that this was a big part of me falling in love with Wisconsin, was learning some about the geology. So I just want to talk about that a little bit here in a couple of slides. Um, if you look at this slide, um, you know, for 500 million years ago, et cetera, um, we, um, we're on the equator, right? So this Laurentia landmass that contained Wisconsin sat astride the equator, was sometimes covered by shallow seas. So this is where we get our sandstone and dolomite bedrock, right? So that's pretty cool, like that you can see rock formations that were formed on that tropical sea. And during the naturalist class, we went to a quarry and we're looking around with a geologist. And I found this piece of sandstone with a brachiopod imprint. And this was just a really stunning moment for me that hold in the palm of my hand this, this thing from you know, 500 million years ago. And I could touch the time of Wisconsin covered by tropical seas astride the equator. 
and I could run my fingers across the imprint of the ridges of the long ago shelled creatures. That was just a, a big moment in the class. And um, since I've been working on my current project, I've been imagining different ways to share this information. So I drew this picture of Wisconsin <laughs> glaciation as an owl. And you can see that um, the owl's left wing is our big green bay lobe of the glacier. Uh, the glacier moving down from the Hudson Bay area about 30,000 years ago. And if you look at the bottom of the owl's wing in Dane County, this is why it's so cool to live here is right. We have all of these interesting glacial formations. We're at where the glacier went to its fullest extent and then eventually withdrew. So we've got this um, movement from glaciated landscape over to the driftless area where there's no glacial drift and just lots of things to discover. So this is a neat image to show how our lakes formed. And you read the image from bottom left up to top right um, that as the Green Bay lobe gets smaller and smaller, you can see as you move from bottom left up to right and the meltwater is pouring off the glacier as it recedes, then our lakes start to form in the old Yahara River channel in our valley. And they, the water can't go anywhere because on the other side of this collecting water, there's a lot of glacial debris. And so we begin lakes form it pulls out. This from geology, uh, Dane, what I want to love this map. At, uh, I just want to size the, um, the extent of glacial Lake Yahara. All the blue you see surrounding the shapes of our current lakes is how big glacial Lake Yahara was. And um, particularly, I want to call your attention to the isthmus between Lake Mendota and Lake Minota, you can see that was all glacial lake. And um, there were just some islands there at the time. And this is why that area is so low and was a wetland but was developed and is zoned to flooding as we saw 2018. Hi, um, Marjorie. So one of the things I like to do. Marjorie. Yeah. Hi, I just want to interrupt yeah. one moment. I want to interrupt one moment and just ask the participants to also uh, stop their videos uh, so that um, we can have because we're we have so many participants that it's pulling on the bandwidth and your and your voice isn't always coming through all of a sudden. So by okay. putting your video on by stopping your video, we're going to put more bandwidth towards your microphone that's that's how it's supposed to work anyway <laughs> let's hope it does so thank you very much everyone okay go on thank you okay so i like to imagine um what um what the landscape looked like you know before glaciation and this is a picture from uh, a park in minnesota looking out over the uh, river mississippi river but this is what picnic point for example would have looked like um, it would have had 500 feet uh, cliffs of sandstone topped with dolomite and um, looking down into a deep river valley. And because when the glacier came through, it shaved off a bit of the top of the bluffs, like 10 to 12 feet, but mostly filled up the river valley below with hundreds of feet of till. So now the highest point above Lake Mendota on Eagle Heights Hill is only 150 feet. But that will to imagine <laughs> what it would look like. And this is another fascinating image I found doing this research. This is a 2015 Google map overlaid with an image drawn in the 19th century by Increase Lapham, who was working so hard to preserve Indian mounds. And um, on the upper right of the image, you see the corner of Lake Monona Bay, right? So uh, where, and then in the middle of the picture, that vertical line of water uh, is Winger Creek. So this was a big dividing ridge, it was called, left by the glacier, it was about 70 feet high, offered stunning views, a lot of Indian mounds on it, and it was all destroyed as Madison was developed because people dug into the ridge to use the sand and gravel for filling wetlands and making roads. But this is just a really neat way to imagine what was once there and I don't know, to be, 
a little bit sad about it too. Another suggestion I have is uh, recently, this is my husband, Ron, walking at Prairie Moraine County Park, actually this week in Verona. To his left, you can see the ridge of the terminal moraine. So that's where the glacier got to his, its fullest uh, reach and then began to withdraw. And at this park, there's a neat um, thing you can download on your phone with the app GeoTourist on 12 and tour of the history. So that's a neat kind of find to be connected to glacial history in the area. All right, so now I wanna talk a little bit about why we love birds because it was birds that brought me to, um, you know, to start sharing pictures and to become a, nat a Wisconsin Master Naturalist and to learn about geologies, the geology uh, formations, geological formations. So what I wanna do here is just let you look at um, a few photos I've taken of birds and I'll just read a little chunk of text as we look at the photos. So. Why do we love birds? Well, they fly. They're beautiful. They're trans, they're fightful, smart and strange. They melt our hearts. They're wild things that offer us glimpses of a world beyond our busy urban existence. They look at us too. They are capable of amazing feats like remembering where they have stored an astonishing number of nuts or successfully navigating vast distances while migrating. They sharpen our senses. We walk slowly, ears and eyes wide open. They make us keenly appreciative of the seasons. They offer a meditative focus that frees our minds from repetitive worries. They reward us for our patience. They challenge us as collectors, list makers, or sharpen our expertise as photographers. We can never learn enough. They are unpredictable, which adds to the thrill. They are magic, enchanting, a veil lifts sometimes and we get to see into a different loop world. So what I wanna talk about next is um, there's, if you look up this link or if you had a link to the presentation, you could find the link, but why bird watching could be healthy for seniors. You can learn about how birding promotes mindfully being in the moment and diligent attention. And the benefits of this kind of meditative practice are numerous. They include reducing anxiety, clearing away information overload, stimulating better focus, lowering blood pressure, and moderating your heart rate. And all these new observations and learning that you do as a bird watcher also keep you mentally sharp and learning new things. Plus, of course, birding encourages exercise. The more you do, the more places you want to go and walk and explore to find new birds. So that's another kind of um, really neat aspect of it. So I'm moving um, toward the end of the presentation now. But first, I want to talk about a little bit about how, what my ecological tree looks like now. So um, when making an ecological tree, uh, ecological identity tree, some people write their current um, actions that manifest their, their roots and their values on leaves and stick them on the tree. So you can imagine if you were doing that with a group, you know, people could make a leaf and go up and to a tree and a wall and so but but going crazy kid with my collage of blossoms from seed catalogs. So um, I put these little bird shapes on again uh, instead. So some of the ways I manifest my values today are my, in my teaching of eco-literacy um, and then uh, going clockwise in my writing, which I'll talk about in a minute, in native gardening in my yard, um, in, in the bird that's hard to read, <laughs> learning about birding and ecology and in my volunteering uh, at Prairie Restoration Oak Savannah sites. 
and then by supporting different organizations that care about the nature natural world and there probably might be more things that anybody could think of like how you share nature with kids or people in your family how you encourage other people to connect to the natural world so this is my book project i'll, I'll just mention briefly <laughs> it looks kind of crazy but so this is Lake Mendota drawn as a bird, just for reference sake. And my idea is that I'm writing 12 essays that start at Picnic Point and circle um, around. Um, and each essay starts with a connection, personal connection, walking or volunteering, or just enjoying one of these spaces. And then it spins into a bigger picture. For example, number one in the middle of the screen, Picnic Point is the beginning point, and then I discuss the geology, geological foundations. In the second chapter of Class of 1918 Marsh, I spin into the bigger picture of draining wetlands in Wisconsin and why that happened and the consequences. And then just one more example, in the third chapter, I start out in graduate school and memories of sitting on the terrace, et cetera, and then move into pondering the indigenous inhabitation around the lake and just kind of startled thinking about how that was something we talked a lot about in grad school uh, about post-colonial issues and and people who were subjected to oppression but we never walked down you know 10 or uh, minutes away and looked at remnants of, of things like the um, inhabitation of earlier peoples in that area and i want to tell that story so i'm about halfway done with this project um and uh and i really hope that it's a deeper history. To finish, um, so did on ecological, marvel over Wisconsin's landscape, the gift of glaciers, pondered why we love watching birds, and hopefully vowed to spend more time outside observing birds. And I just have here four examples of ways you can um, explore some writing opportunities. So um, an interesting prompt is to use an old photo and just start writing in present tense, describing the photo and see where it goes. So in the example I have here, I wrote you know, in a photo from 1967 of our whole family at Yellowstone, my mom's gaze seems to linger over me, arm reaching out to touch my back but the lack of clarity in the photo leaves me longing even now for her touch, for the surety of her hand on my back. So you just start writing and see where it goes. It's really fun to try a writing from an old photo. Another example is something that's really popular in writing workshops where you just time yourself for 60 seconds and write five memorable trees or five memorable cars. Then spend another 60 seconds looking at that list, circling what holds the most emotional charge, and then write for 10 minutes, no editing, no judgment, just in the present tense, you're in that car or you're remember that, that moment, make it vivid, make it come alive, and you'd be surprised where that takes you. Another fun thing is to just use a pattern from a poem you love and play, right? Maybe Wordsworth's I wandered lonely as a cloud becomes I puttered slowly as a toad. And in my last um, point here, just want to offer how I encourage students to write a nature essay. Um, so I, I suggest that they start with an observation in present tense, like the bird's black body gleams in the sunlight, the striking reddish orange epaulets at the shoulders flaring up when he lowers his head to screech a warning. And then transition into a memory evoked by that observation my mother and I often laughed at the raw antics of red blackbirds as we walked along a stream near our house, a picnic lunch packed in an old basket, for example. Then weave in a quotation from a book you're reading or another nature writer like Aldo Leopold, perhaps the words of the 13th century poet Rumi inspire you. No more words in the name of this place we drink in with our breathing. Stay quiet like a flower. So the night birds will start singing. And then the, you could wrap up your nature essay with trying to draw out a big, bigger picture, um, you know, that, that maybe it's about how the, the call of the blackbirds 
that you start with open up this window and, and, and take you back to moments in your past. So those are just some fun ways that I wanted to share about just playing with writing and not being afraid to write. And so I want to wrap up and just encourage everybody, get out there and go birding. It's such a magical time of year to see birds right now. So thank you. And I'd be happy to, um, to share any questions. Thank you so much, Marjorie. I'm sure we'll have lots of questions. And I know I have some, but I'll wait uh, to see what others have first. And if you want to open your video now, I think one at a time we can do that after we speak. I'm going to hide my video again. <laughs> case of the bandwidth. Oops. I don't have a, a question, but I just want to comment. I'm Gisela Kutzbach from the Lakeshore Nature Preserve, and I have known uh, March for some time, and uh, I just remember these wonderful times, March, when we were planting wildflowers together mm -hmm. at the Nature Preserve and you were talking about your project. And it, it's just most wonderful to see it come to fruition at this point and to see how it has expanded into something much bigger than just the cultural history of the preserve. Something that really uh, tells about your own uh, ecological awareness development and uh, gives us all an example to explore how we have come to the point where we are. Your example of the uh, a tree with the branches and the roots and now the leaves, that is a simply wonderful exercise. So thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you so much, Gisela. I appreciate it. I'll never forget the wonderful lemon cake you made us for a, a treat when we were working. <laughs> <laughs> Marge, I was wondering if you would tell us a little bit about um, just the prairie volunteer and prairie restoration work that you're doing and then and then also about birds that you've seen while doing that. Okay. Um, How you got involved and where. And so yeah, on. I think th um, during the master naturalist class, we, I, we did a field trip to Holy Wisdom, where I had been before. If people don't know, it's you um, a little bit um, west of us, but and uh, I just really felt drawn to that um, monastery and, and the land there. And so they have work days um, typically once a month on a Wednesday. And I found that going there and like, um, you know, I guess a really memorable day for me was um, going there the morning after the 2016 election <laughs> and uh, um and we planted seeds. And so we just, I had, a, was handed a bucket full of wood shavings that were just really beautiful, like cantaloupe colored wood shavings where the little seeds were mixed in. So you could throw the seeds out and, and they would go farther with the wood shavings and not be blown away so much in the wind. And it was just so meditative and soothing, almost like, you know, um, running your hands over beads of a rosary or, or um, Buddhist beads, like to, to be doing that motion and, and to, to be, um, you know, uh, fostering new growth. Um, and was, I just found it so soothing and meaningful that day. And um, we planted oak trees out there and that was really an incredible day where, um, uh, Robert, Robin uh, Wall Kimmerer had talked at the monastery the night before and she came out and worked with us, the, the author of Braiding Sweetgrass and ended up on my team. And I was like a little starstruck teenager. Oh my God. And then, but, um, and like just being out there, a red tailed hawk flew over and we, we were planting these trees that were maybe six feet tall. And I just had that moment where I thought, you know, my grandkids would be able to come back and like look at all these oak trees and 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 be connected to this um, this activity. And at the end of that day, we were all so tired and hot that somebody started beating on a turned over white bucket of that had carried water, and we all kind of just started dancing. <laughs> it was like it was a crazy 
time, but I, I um, so in my book project, what I've learned more and more is like how those projects, uh, whether at Holy Monastery or the Lake Shore Preserve, putting in those plants with those long roots that draw things like phosphorus down into the roots is protecting the lake so incredibly much from from having all those contaminants get into the lake. And so you really feel like you're making a difference, even if it seems like the world is a challenging place in many ways and you wonder what you can do. I think getting out there and working with a group of people, you feel like you're, you're doing what you can to make a difference. So it's been a really powerful experience. Thank you, that sounds, sounds really great, wonderful. I really liked the um, why we love birds text that you shared and wrote. I'm wondering if you would, is it, it I didn't see it, that there was a link for it or anything when you were scrolling through the image. It's of actually birds. just, um, it's in the, the, um, the story itself as a script, but I just skimmed over it, but yeah. Oh, it is. I, okay. yeah. I would love to have a copy of that. that was okay, really thanks, awesome. yeah. I'm Marjorie. It's Julie Melton. Oh, Julie, hi. <laughs> I, I really enjoyed your presentation. And um, also, I love the maps. They're terrific. Those, um, especially the ones that show um, the, the glacial Lake Yahara and how it developed. And that's really cool. And, and everything you said about birds, I could concur. And just thinking, what a beautiful way for people to start thinking about birds is to think about themselves and but then think well i could benefit and so do the birds from my interest in them um i wanted to comment um the work days are happening at holy wisdom and next wednesday is one they're wednesday oh, okay and they're going to be every other week um, we have a new director of land management and environmental education her name is amy alstead so if anyone's interested, they could go on the website and you don't have to sign up, you can just come. Um, but if you wanna get in touch with Amy, I can, I can, I try to put her email in the chat, but the chat's disabled. So I could say it online here or they could just go to the website. Yeah, I think the website's good. Yeah, um, Julie was my teacher and uh, one of the teachers in my Wisconsin Master Naturalist class. So that's been a really wonderful connection to um, to get to know each other more deeply through working at Holy Wisdom. Yeah. And will your talk be um, archived? Can other people see it if they missed this morning? I'm not it, sure. It, it has been recorded and it'll be on the um, Monona Senior Center YouTube mm -hmm. channel. Is that right, Diane? Right, it'll be on the Monona Community Media YouTube channel under the Senior Center playlist. Okay, thank and you. I can send that link to Marjorie and Lita. Um, I don't think I have all of your email addresses, but um, share, you know, wherever you'd like. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I can ask a, a bird joke and see what people want to answer. Um, so why did the bird fly into the library? Hmm. Does anybody have an idea? <laughs> no. <laughs> he wanted to find a bookworm. <laughs> Any more questions? Marge. Hi, uh, hi. my sister. <laughs> yes. Um, you encouraged me to uh, find someplace locally to do what you do at Holy Wisdom. Um, so I will start that today because I'm trying to get out more and we don't have as many birds as you guys seem to have back there, but uh, maybe I'm just not looking close enough, so. Awesome, that makes me happy. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, thanks. I'd like to hear a little bit about the gardening that you do, the native gardening and um, what you've learned doing that. Okay. Um, so this is something that um, my husband got into first and um, not even sure how that, that happened, but the main um, avenue for us was 
getting really involved with the UW Arboretum and going to the annual conferences they have there in September where you can go to different talks and learn things about what plants would be, native plants would be good for your garden and then buying those plants at the Arboretum um, uh, sale, which they have every May. Um, and my husband learned from, um, through people at the Arboretum to try to make these <laughs> uh, funny, who would make these elaborate grids about which plant went where and try to color code the grid so that he knew that plants were blooming at different times of the year. And my, my daughter and I laughed at his old accounting habits coming into play. But um, we, we basically took out sections of lawn on our property by um, covering those areas with you know, cardboard um, f during part of the year and killing what's there and then replanting it with native plants. And I guess the most astonishing result I, is that my backyard really feels like a park now, right? It feels like when I walk out there to uh, enjoy it, that there's in the summer, like so many beautiful, different kinds of native plants flowering. And the insect life is extraordinary, like just finding cool insects. I've become a big uh, insect photographer, <laughs> but um, watching, you know, uh, insects and spider webs. But then the birds that come in, it's not so much us feeding the birds anymore, but um, birds that find that, especially in the fall, that the seeds of those native plants are nurturing them. So, um, you know, I've become a real convert. I don't even think I knew at first when we started that project that about how important the long, long roots of native plants are for holding water in, in the landscape instead of letting water just run down the street, for example, and go into a storm drain. Um, and it just keeps um, anything problematic out of the watershed if you can hold um, substances on your landscape right like that. So I really recommend that getting hooked up with the UW Arboretum offerings um, is a huge stepping stone to native gardening. Thank you very much. I have a pretty big front lawn that I've been talking with my kids about, you know, converting like you've described, but I don't have the knowledge. So I will definitely uh, connect to the Arboretum conferences. Thanks. Yeah. Could I suggest also, there is an organization called Sustain Dane. Um, you could Google that. They offer native plants at a very reasonable price. Uh, you must pre-order and I believe the time is over now for pre-ordering. But I have gotten plants from them that have been very good. These are native plants. And I too have converted to native plants. And among native versus non-native, you can clearly see the birds and insects going to the natives more than the non-natives. And I find this year I have more birds in my yard through that effort than I have ever had before. It's been enchanting. Yeah, thank you. And you remind me that um, if people haven't read any of Doug Ptolemy's work on he's given, he's, there's probably things online you could find where he's given talks. It's um, T-A-L-L. A M Y, right? But he has uh, just done really important work about um, why you need to be nurturing insects in your yard, especially um, you know offering plants that where caterpillars thrive. Because in the spring, birds need those protein-rich caterpillars to feed their young, and um, it, his work is just so inspiring to me that that it really shows you why if more and more people created native gardening patches, we could really help sustain 
the bird population in a crucial way. So he's got a new book out that's called The Ecology of Oak Trees or something like that, but just about how important oak trees in particular are for nurturing such a huge variety of caterpill caterpillars that birds depend on. I have another question about the, um, you talked about an app and I think you were talking about the glacial history and oh, yeah. ge geology. What's the name of that app? The again? app is called GeoTourist, just one <coughs> word. And um, okay. yeah, that was an amazing discovery the other day. Um, and that, that Dane County Pleistocene geology map you can find online. And I look at that all the time and I, like we went over to Elver Park recently and I wanted to know why is Elver Park so hilly? So I'm looking at that map trying to figure out like what's the geology of, of, of that park? And that's when I saw, oh my gosh, there's this park that's right on the terminal moraine, that Prairie Moraine County Park. And so we, we went there to, to kind of just try to understand like, what what is a moraine and and what remnants of it you can still see but yeah the app is called geotourist tourist yeah any other is, questions yeah there's there's really, time. Uh, uh, the ice age trail has a ton of information on the uh, glaciers and so on. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. That's an important, um, you know, an amazing thing. And um, I don't know if people will follow the story recently that um, a, a woman just became the first woman to hike the whole Ice Age Trail of 1200 miles in the winter um, Emily, and um, it was just a cool thing to follow. Um, and she also happens to be African American. Um, and so she was, she ended up like becoming this kind of voice for getting more um, people of color out in, into natural spaces. And, but the Ice Age Trail is just something I think we don't, we don't appreciate enough in Wisconsin that, that it's here. And, um, and there's, uh, if you like Facebook, you can follow the Ice Age Trail on Facebook and people are always posting different, um, different segments of it that they have hiked and it's really inspiring. I have a question on March. Yeah. When, are, when is your book coming out? <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know, I, I hope, uh, I'm really excited right now I can just like, get back into it for the summer. And, um, you know, I may have to make some decisions about that. I can't do everything that I, I <laughs> thought I could do because every, every part of it spins into so much, you know, um, but um, I don't know, maybe, maybe another year. Yeah. And Julie, I'm going to do another master naturalist class. I don't know if you heard me say no. <laughs> up at Willow River State Park. And even though it's so far up there, uh, a, a former student offered to let me stay overnight every time I go up six different times. So I'm excited. <laughs> yeah. Great, great. Here's Cheryl here. Marjorie, do you hear, do you hear me? Yes, I do, Cheryl. Oh, thank you. Oh, I really enjoyed this. I love, li I love learning. This is great. And I heard you and Lita were sp speaking about identifying bird calls did i was that correct yeah and maybe Lita can share yeah, yeah there's okay, an can app me? sure Thank there's you. an app on your phone that you can download it's called bird net and um if you open it and you're near a bird song if you just press one button it records a little bit of sound and then you can stop the recording and um it will analyze the sound and tell you which bird it is and I've had a lot of fun learning. I mean, it's very accurate and it amazes me how well it works. Oh. So bird net, be just bird net one word. Very bird. easy to use, yeah. Oh, thank you, that's so fun. Thank you. 
I hope people are getting a chance to find some baby sandhill cranes called colts. Um, I know last year I found a pair in Edna Taylor. Uh, and this year, right now, I'm watching a pair of colts at Middleton Hills Park be, uh, that's on behind Pick and Save as you uh, in Middleton as you head out Century. And they're just like, oh my gosh, so fun to, to watch um, and interact and, um, and eat all those bugs that their parents so patiently find. <laughs> I think I saw one for the Monona folks just um, at Schluter Beach this morning to the right of the beach in that little causeway. And yesterday, um, I saw two colts with their parents. I live in, in the Conservancy Creek condos down by Menards, and they were two darling colts out with their parents. And this was the first time that I guess anyone in our building had seen them. We look right, I look right into that little woods and the little creek. And it was so precious. I was so fortunate to see them. Oh, Beautiful. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yes, it was nice. If there are no more questions, I just want to ask one more time if there's anything else. In that case, I want to thank you again, Marjorie, for coming today and sharing your time and all of your beautiful stories and um, helping us look at nature and our own um, ecological identity and so on. It was really educational and fun and inspiring. Um, and uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I enjoyed it. Okay. So those of you that gave your email, you'll receive a link from the Monona Senior Center to